We should also be looking at recommendation systems. A recommendation is an editorial decision. I don't see why it matters if it's made by an algorithm or by a human being. It is an editorial decision. And so if you're making a recommendation and you're drawing some value, some consideration from the user then visiting that article, be it in data, in ad money or whatever, then at what point should you be considered a publisher too, right? You're doing the work of a publisher. Maybe you should be under similar constraints. Hi, everybody. This is How Tech Becomes Law, a public interest tech podcast about technology, public policy, and career advice. We are your co-hosts, Jingyan Zhang and Dhruv Gupta. This week, we have a conversation with Robin Bergen from the New York Times about how technology and data privacy intersects with the news industry. Robin is Vice President of Data Governance at the New York Times, where he works on improving privacy and on making sure that the web can support a thriving media ecosystem. He's worked extensively on technology and internet governance. Hey, thanks so much for joining, Robin. Really appreciate your time and really excited to have this conversation. Can you just tell us a little bit more about what you're up to at The Times? Sure. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. So at The Times, I, I run the data governance team. I've been doing that for the past four years. It's a bit of a not bunch of a team. We do, we do a number of different things. Uh, one is stuff like traditional data governance, things like data quality, data management, documentation, all, all, all that stuff. Uh, we haven't done that much of it, but we've been ramping it up. But another one of the core things that we do is privacy. The data governance team handled things like the GDPR and the CCPA projects for new privacy laws. We own systems that support regulatory work for all kinds of jurisdictions. Uh, but we also work on things like the policy of not having third-party data controllers outside marketing-specific pages on the site, uh, or more recently on setting standards for handling children's data. And as part of that, as like a, a third pillar, is that we look to the broader ecosystem and figure out how the times should integrate with internet, the internet standards, uh, the platforms, and how we can help shape that ecosystem so that it, it supports a better media world um, and, and a free and independent press. So on that point, why do you think it's important for the New York Times to have a strong and effective data privacy system in place? I think it's uh, it's absolutely vital because a, as a news source, the trust of our readers is absolutely essential. Without without that, we 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 don't exist, and and trust in news is in a really bad place these days. So that makes trust even more important uh, than it would normally be, and it's it's very hard to be a trusted source of news if you're not also trustworthy in your business practices. We have these strong separations to prevent the business from having any undue influence on the newsroom side, of course. But if the business isn't acting in a trustworthy way, then why would you believe that we're actually respecting those barriers? And so privacy violations are really violations of trust, right? The betrayals of your readers, of, of your users. And so I think it's absolutely important for, for the media to, to be focused on privacy. I always get a little sad when I hear colleagues in the media saying that readers need to understand the value exchange. But it's a common phrase to say that users should like accept um, that they have to give up privacy in order to read the news, at least without without paying. And I think that's that's absolutely nonsense. If only because it'll never happen. No one, no, no reader sees a value exchange in having the data taken. They just hate you in silence. And so, so <laughs> you really have to take that into account as part of your relationship and really focus on the trust. And I'm not saying that the times is perfect here. It's a, it, we're pushing up against very entrenched practices in the industry. Um, but I think we're headed there and that, that's really important. And I'd be comfortable sitting down with a times reader and explaining what we do with the data. I, I think that matters a lot for trust. Yeah. What's interesting about what you said is you put the literal words that you just said in the mouths of any data privacy officer in Silicon Valley, they might have said something similar. Like, do you think the New York Times is, is doing something particularly unique in terms of data privacy from other Silicon Valley companies, maybe social media aside? <laughs> I mean, yeah, let, let's not look too closely at social media for sure. Yeah. But it, it, in general, I, I don't know if the difference is so much between news 
and tech companies that I think the Times is quite special for, for the newsroom we have and for the reporting we do. But other than that, on the business side, it's, it's very much a tech product company. Um, and so on the, uh, uh, in that sense, we're not all that different from any number of, uh, of tech companies. So I think that the difference is more in terms of how you relate to your users uh, and how you you relate to the future. If you really need your users' trust to exist, then you're much likely likelier to focus on privacy more. It's true for us, but it could be true for any startup anywhere. I, I, Dina Srinivasan wrote this, this really great paper about how Facebook increased privacy when they had to compete and decreased privacy when they became more, more dominant. And she really traced that history back since the, since the beginning. And I, I think that's true across the board. It's probably true of pretty much every other company. And so if you're looking for a quick exit, um, you probably won't have the same view of privacy. You, you, you might not care that much as if you're like a 170-year-old company. I mean, in Silicon Valley, they probably don't have 170-year-old companies that much. But if you're planning for that company to live another 170, then you really can't use that, lose, lose that trust. So I, I would say that's, that's primarily the focus. But it could happen in the Valley too. So one point that I thought was really interesting, at least in terms of one of the words that you used, is talking about your experience for the users and what's happening to users. And given the history of the times and it's over a hundred years old, right? I mean, a hundred years ago, they would not think of people as users. They would think of them as readers. And how do you think of navigating that transition of what does it mean to have readers of a traditional newspaper versus having users of the New York Times today and all the different technology products of the New York Times today? It's interesting in the sense that this, like, and internally we speak of readers and users interchangeably, and some people will focus more on one than, than on the other. Um, but I think there's there's really an interesting flow in that in the transition from print to, to digital. It's important that we think about how the technology is used and how it relates to the news content. Right, the, the the news is the star of the show. It can't be about the technology, but how do you make technology that really supports that? And this can show up in all kinds of different places. So normally in the news context, the decision of what you get to amplify, what you get to put forward, it's a core editorial uh, decision. So if you start to build recommender systems that are somehow automated and personalized, how do you make them integrate into that, that set of values in which what's recommended to you is what's relevant and what's newsworthy, as opposed to something that might be clickbait? And so it, figuring out the integration of technology into a news environment is, is interesting because you have to come at it from a very, very much a non-technical angle. Does that mean that the perspective and like value criterion is more about readership enablement rather than building maybe new interesting technology and, and more about how to empower a reader to use the technology better versus like delivering it in some different way? Yeah, absolutely. It, it has to be absolutely reader focused. And I, I really like the word empowerment that you use. For me, there are two ways, two large ways of approaching the creation of technology. One is services and the other is tools. And a tool is something that when as a user, you get it, the world becomes richer. The, you, you see more affordances. It, it, the, we always joke that if you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but it's true, right? It's because when you have a hammer, like the, the world becomes filled with nail affordances. But it's true, like if you hold a camera, then everything looks like a picture. And so tools should really empower and develop the affordances of the world. And I think that's key to how we should use technology. Services, on the other hand, they seek to drive people that are under someone else's control. You're shifting the, the work to a servant. Sometimes that's fine if it's really something you don't want to do, if it's something you don't want to care about. But for the important stuff, you don't want to be guided. You don't want to be controlled by an, uh, an external entity. And so really, it, uh, evidently, if, you, if you're trying to help and, and support and empower people, then you need to develop technology that's more like tools to understand the world than, than services to, to get rid of it, essentially. That's a really interesting distinction. So one of the aspects in terms of public policy that we're seeing is how do we provide people, users that are using technology, more control over their data. So 
as a data pr privacy professional, what are your thoughts on how, for example, European Union's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, has changed the industry? The GDPR, I think we're all disappointed to see how ineffective enforcement has been, especially with, with Ireland acting as basically a data haven where you can get away with pretty much whatever you want. It's clear if you look at the text of the GDPR that, that if it were fully enforced, it would be great for privacy and great for competition. But even if it's not, if it's not what we're seeing right now, uh, that being said, in the context of the, the way you're, you're looking at it, I do think the GDPR has had an effect on the industry. I think one of the effects it has had has been indirect um, in that it helped to drive a lot of recognition that the data practices of the digital world are completely out of control. I think a lot of lawyers and technologists who thought they knew what was going on, they knew it wasn't great, they knew, might have known it was bad, but when they had to do that diligence of looking at, at the data because of the GDPR, they discovered that it was even worse than their worst case scenario. And I think that process, even if it didn't bring about immediate change, brought a change of mentality and, and a realization that we need to do something about it. Um, and I think... Another thing that the GDPR is helping with is this long tradition in, in, in privacy of thinking that control is a solution, right? You, you mentioned control, control over the data. Um, and because of that, uh, it, there's this long tradition of the FIPS of notice and choice. I, I think GDPR took that as far as it can go. And we see that it doesn't work, right? Consent at scale. If you don't have an IRB, if you don't have a grad student to explain to people what, what the informed choices that they're about to make, um, it just doesn't work. And so even though there's a role for consent, it needs to exist in some cases, it really should be rare and short-lived, and it can't be the load-bearing component of, of an approach to privacy. And I really think that uh, the data authorities could reorient that. The GDPR is, is a big toolbox, right? And there's been a focus on consent, mostly because it's what helps the people who don't want privacy the most. It's, the, it's like the weak spot. Um, but if data authorities like, try to rely on other parts of that GDPR toolbox, I think they could have much stronger effect with things like, um, I don't know, like these codes of conduct that are enforceable for certain industries, focusing on, on allowing legitimate interest processing if it's privacy respecting. There's a whole slew of things that could really help in there. Is there a technology solution to any of this? Are there any technologies here that are coming out like federated learning, differential privacy, a bunch of other stuff around blockchain that might be exciting to you? Or is it really a policy solution? I mean, it, it, I don't think anything is purely policy or purely tech in terms of solutions. We, we're going to have to use both in pretty much every single case. On the tech front, uh, there's a lot that I'm simultaneously excited and worried about. I don't, I don't know if there's a good word for that. Terry, Terry, excited or something like that. <laughs> it, it, it's just that we're seeing these very powerful solutions emerge. Um, but I'm not sure that we've done the philosophical and the thinking required to understand how to deploy them properly. For instance, you mentioned differential privacy, and the same goes with a lot of the federated learning solutions. A lot of these developments are completely focused on individual privacy, which is the lens through which we tend to see privacy problems these days. And so the idea is to make sure that the processing of your data does not affect you personally. But that doesn't solve issues of collective privacy, right? If you're treated differently because you're part of a cohort, even if no one learned that you're in that cohort, uh, if no one no one found out anything about it, but you got discriminated against, you're not better off, right? And so I think there's a lot we need to figure out in that space in order to make it fruitful. Even if a lot of the there's definitely a lot of a, a lot of promise there. And same thing, you mentioned blockchain. I, I'm suspicious of a lot of the stuff that, that, that's being built on blockchain for good reasons. There's a lot of grift and there's a lot of vaporware. In the blockchain space, there's a lot of people thinking about governance technologies and new ways of voting, new ways of shared ownership, new ways of new, new methods of collective ownership that intersect with commoning and platform co-ops and a, a whole world of things that we haven't often managed to build successfully and that might be able to, to be implemented on, on the blockchain. And it, at the end of the day, it might happen that 
all this thinking around like governance technologies might end up being implemented off chain. It might be that we figure out important things and they don't need the blockchain. That's not the important part. The important part becomes these new modes of governance. But it's in the blockchain space that people are really thinking about that. And, and I think that's a very promising area. But again, we need to get it right. And a lot of the time, we barely have the answers. So digging a little further, I'm curious to get your take on thinking about what is the role of data for technologies, but also for businesses, especially because you brought up the point of thinking about data privacy, not just as being about individuals, but actually about collectives. Then does that run into conflict with the aspect of thinking about, oh, as a business, we have to monetize our data. We have to use it as this new form of capital or the new oil um, that's going to power our business. And it's in our own best interest to use it in whatever way is most effective for our own purposes. And as long as no individual's privacy is harmed, then that is the bar that needs to be met. What are your thoughts on that perspective that is commonly adopted throughout the industry? That's why I don't think we can think uh, exclusively about individual privacy and why I'm worried about what learnings could be extracted from data, e even without individual privacy being compromised. So you could think of a differentially private system um, that supposedly doesn't learn anything uh, you know, about an, any individual, or at least it doesn't matter whether that individual is in the data set or not, but that really figures out how to control a population in terms of what news is going to amplify, what, what content is going to give preference to, et cetera. And that could be um, very harmful, very harmful exploitation of data without harming individual privacy. So we need to really stop thinking only about issues of, of personal information directly, but also really extend that towards asymmetries of automation um, and broader asymmetries of knowledge that might not be like the, the core data itself, but what you've extracted from it. I think that's a pretty good segue into our, our next question here around the independent press. You and I both, I'm sure, agree on this, that a strong independent press is incredibly vital to the health of a democracy. And we're seeing that threatened, not just in the US, but around the world, both in terms of you know, new business challenges and also in terms of new political challenges. On the business side, you've been doing a lot of work here on the challenge of news consumption, especially through aggregate platforms like Google, Apple News, Facebook, etc. Can you tell us more about your work here and maybe what your proposals are around changing the architecture of online news publications? Sure. The core problem that I think we need to solve is really that today, as a publisher, you can't maintain any sovereignty. The two most important assets that you can develop as a publisher are content, you know, which draws people, um, and knowledge of your audience, which draws advertising. And I'm sorry, there's a cat behind me. Um, and it, it, it's the internet, it's the cat, and we're talking about con content <laughs> aggregation technologies, which is the acronym. So I think... <laughs> But yes, returning to sovereignty, if I may, platforms just basically help themselves to your content as a publisher and to your audience. They they don't even ask permission. They take it or they force you into it. Um, it's almost impossible to participate in advertising or marketing, which is something you need if you're a subscription-based business, without giving your readers data to the platform, right? You can't keep it. And even if you somehow manage to exit that system in the way that, for instance, the markup does, they're really strict on privacy. They're funded anyway, so they've managed to exit that system. But even then, Chrome is still taking their audience data through Chrome Sync. So there's no escape. Even they can escape uh, Google wanting to know how their audience behaves. Um, and then the platforms use that data to compete against publishers in the advertising market. So it, it's a very difficult situation. And there's the same thing on the content side. So you mentioned content aggregation. Initially, the contract was that a search engine would index your content and then use that you know, to, to show links in, in search results and that drives traffic to you. And that model is fine, right? It's very mutualistic. You, we're helping each other out there. Um, but that model's dead. It's not, it's not the world we're, we're currently in, right? The, the platforms keep finding new ways to force publishers to give them content, you know, things like app or, or, sh or sh showcase, or it's a very long list. And so basically the core problem we have is that 
if you're trying to provide information or to build a relationship with a reader that isn't intermediated through the platforms, they will find a way to come after you. And none of that is even for the for the user's benefit. If you, if you look on the App Store, that extension that gets rid of AMP is one of the most popular and, and highest rated things in there. So it, it's purely for them. And really, the idea behind the CAT proposal, which is a, a document I, I, I brought up at the at the W2C and on which there's going to be some iteration in the future, is just the, the, the core point there is, is maybe that's not the right solution, but it's to show that other ways of implementing this are possible. One thing that's stopping legislators and regulators from intervening is that they keep hearing that the way things work today is the only way they can work. And so what I'm trying to do is to stimulate the Im- imagination to show that alter- technical alternatives um, possible. We, we have the technology. Uh, we can build a publishing ecosystem that's not you know, hostile to publishers and hostile to users. Um, but the thing is, technology alone can't fix it. It can propose solutions, but we're going to need some kind of policy enforcement to go hand in hand with it. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of policy uh, solutions we can use to, to make this better. So yeah, can you talk a little more about the kind of solutions that you're envisioning? I mean, very, very quickly, in terms of policy, one thing is that we could rule out third-party data controllers. It, as, as an online system, it's normal that you would rely on third parties because modern technology is so complex that you need you know, providers. You need, you need, but there's no reason that they would then be allowed to use, reuse your data or reuse what they learn uh, from your platform. And so in, in that same vein, separating platforms and commercial pur- purposes, it, it could help a lot, right? As a platform, you should not be uh, allowed to reuse data or reuse content for purposes other than those in, in which you've engaged with the, with the, with the business at hand. Um, I think beyond that, we could we should also be looking at recommendation systems. A recommendation is an editorial decision. I, I don't see why it matters if it's made by an algorithm or by a human being. It is an editorial dis- decision. And so if you're making a recommendation and you're drawing some value, some consideration from the user then visiting the article, be it in data, in ad money or whatever, then at what point should you be considered a publisher too, right? You're doing the work of a publisher, maybe you should be under similar constraints. But more more broadly, I mean, if I had like one thing, it's not a solution in itself, but I think we need to encourage a lot more collaboration between technologists who understand what other implementations are possible and policymakers who understand how regulation works. By being too isolated from one another as communities, we're not coming up with like, uh, holistic solutions that that could really help here. Do you think in this space that you have lots of different publishers, right? You have the New York Times, the Washington Post, but also you have lots of online news outlets that don't necessarily have these hundred year histories behind them that in a sense are also competing with each other in terms of the content. And in that sense, makes it harder for this collective action that you may envision publishers take relative to the large tech platforms like Google, Apple, and Facebook, which has that scale to be able to make more unilateral demands. Absolutely. I, I think that's a problem not just for publishers, but that's a problem of the internet as a whole. It, it Basically, because everything's open and you have full end-to-end connectivity. It's as if there was there, there, were, there were no friction. There was nothing to keep people separate. And so it's like everyone's in the same big bucket. Therefore, anything that can apply some power, uh, be it like a two-sided market or anything that can structure this bucket, um, can only be met with collective action. But because the numbers are so huge, collective action becomes becomes ever more difficult, right? It, it's exponentially difficult the more participants you have. And so we're really in a situation where whoever grabs power keeps power. And there's no there's no local structure that provides some robustness, some community uh, that, that can push back. It's true of publishers, but it's it's true of people in general. This also brings up a broader issue that we've been seeing for the last few years around misinformation. It seems like misinformation has grabbed a lot of this power. Disinformation is, you know, just affecting our political systems completely. How do we maybe leverage that collective action? Is there a data or technology tool here to fight misinformation rather than spread it? There's multiple drivers of misinformation, but I think what makes misinformation a crisis today is the fact that we have a media monoculture 
right? If you think of the role of, of media as deciding what gets amplified, um, that hasn't changed, right? It's always been that way. One good situation is when you have media diversity, um, and that means that different media will make different decisions as to what to amplify. And so if one or some make a bad decision, um, you'll get some limited impact from that bad decision, but it won't go everywhere, right? Whereas in, in the media monoculture we have today, um, any bad decision affects the entire system. And so you get massive scale to misinformation immediately. And so, you know, the way I really try to think about this is to forget the technology, um, because technology gets in the way of, of thinking about these things, right? You know, imagine it's the 80s. I mean, I don't know if, if either of you were born in the, in the 80s, but I was there. Cool clothes, great music. Um, and so, but yeah, you're like so, a dinosaur, man. Sorry. We're like- <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And so, but, but say, let's imagine it's the 80s. We don't have the internet the way we have, we have it today. It's basically this, this, thing for a few scientists and and, and nerds um and, and imagine we let just like two media moguls like buy essentially all of the world's media companies if you imagine that situation we'd get a lot of misinformation right you imagine the tabloid press at scale that's what makes money you'd get a few good reporting in in corners but it would be a huge tabloid fest and that's exactly the world we're in we have we basically have two media companies Google and Facebook and they're making editorial decision for everyone else's content right it 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 it's they're deciding what gets amplified they're deciding what gets to be on the first page of results what gets to be at the top of the news feed um and this centralization of editorial power actually made worse once you add the technology back in because the technology, since it, it personalizes the results for everyone, it actually makes this media monoculture opaque and, and impossible to render accountable because you don't know who's getting what. Um, and so you know, in terms of addressing that, uh, we need tech and policy solutions that can enforce standards of accountability so we could think of privacy-preserving ways of knowing what's at the top, what's being amplified, um, without knowing who saw what or where, but we know knowing at least what's getting pushed to the top. I think we also need things like mandatory interoperability to to break these media empires down into into smaller chunks and build standards to to go with that, so that we can like break this media monoculture. So, do you think, given the editorial powers that you're describing in terms of what the algorithms at Facebook and Google can highlight or not highlight and show in front of people that there, there's an overemphasis on engagement and that in versus if we go back to the 1980s and you have human editors who are trained as journalists and who are professionals that yes, they care about making sure their articles are read, but there's also a human judgment that is missing from the way that technology is deciding uh, what editorial decisions should be made? I, I think the problem isn't so much human versus machine decision-making. It, it's really whether you have a rich ecosystem of decision-makers or if you have only two decision-makers, right? Before Google and Facebook took over the media landscape, I'm not going to say that the system was perfect, right? It was a gatekeeping system um, that was probably too elitist, insufficiently diverse, et cetera, et cetera. But you still had hundreds of thousands of people making editorial decisions. And even if we assume that they all optimized for engagement, which they didn't, but even if they had, they would be getting different opinions and different approaches to that. And that builds robustness into the system because it creates this diversity of approaches. Um, and they can specialize. One is going to like drive towards engagement for a local geography, for a specific kind of reader, et cetera. And this will create an ecosystem with the built-in diversity to be robust to all kinds of nasty effects. Again, if you remove the algorithms, remove the technology, but you had one big editor-in-chief for Google and one big editor-in-chief for for Facebook and have them make the decisions for everyone as to what gets amplified, it doesn't matter if it's focused on engagement or some other metric, you're going to get nasty side effects. So can you speak a little bit about your experience actually working at an organization that has played a huge role in creating the internet, um, the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, and projects like HTML5 that you worked on, which has become the standard for many for websites today. How do you see the way forward in terms of is it new standards? Is it 
new organizations that need to be created to tackle these data privacy and misinformation problems? We need so much. I think the first step is we need a, a collective rethink of our issues. It, it's hard to know even, even where to start. It's uh, people in technology have a lot of built-in assumptions that they have never questions and never challenged. So for instance, the, the assumption of end-to-end -end connectivity and openness of the network seems naturally good, right? It's, it's like a built-in good that you can just like connect to anything and everything is like this big mosh pit of interconnection. In truth, we probably need to introduce more friction into the technology so that you can break away islands of governance and build this this polycentricity. And so that's that's one level in which we, we need to do better. Another level is, I mean, if you look at these global organizations for standards, and they, they are trying to, to do some good, but um, calling yourself global is not enough to be global. And there's this recurring joke that, that WWW actually means white Western and not women. And I think that's that's uh, very true of the standards community overall, or, and we Yikes. need to change that. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> it's it, it, it's a fact, and it's I don't think there's a silver bullet to change that. You can't like snap your fingers and decide that it's going to be different. But you need to think about organization and you know, cost of of participation, what the internal culture is like, language barriers. There's there's a lot to 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 improve on on that front. And then in terms of the standards we build, we need to exit this narrow understanding of standards making that we've been sticking to, which is very technical. And we need to use standards organizations as places that can start to engage in broader topics, like defining privacy, um, defining governance, how should that work? And once we get there, I really hope that we can use this to trigger involvement from non-technologists. Um, who right now don't have a seat at the table because even if they come, they're going to be snowed under an avalanche of tech details about the minute aspects of a browser a runtime engine or, or whatever. We need to make it more welcoming you know, in so many dimensions, but also to non-technology so that we can build these bridges between tech and policy. Speaking of tech and policy, you have a really storied history kind of bouncing all over the place. Can you speak a little bit more about just your journey up here and, and like how you fell into this space and, and what you've learned and maybe what you might have given as advice to someone who's starting out trying to do what you do? Sure. I mean, I don't know if I've been very logical. In in hindsight, it looks storied. It, it might just have been chaotic. But <laughs> you, you mentioned advice. I think if if I had one maybe piece of advice, I, I'd say don't go for the shiny stuff. Most of the time in tech, the shiny stuff is completely fake. Um, so you won't get anything out of it. Um, even if it's real, uh, if it's like really shiny and really well done, then often there's, there's just not that much you can do to it apart from just like use it. Um, and so you become this recipient of something that you might become an expert in, but you don't have that much agency. Personally, I've, I've preferred really dumpster fire, uh, pile of trash things that people would not approach. People in the right mind, all my friends would like, why are you, why are you even doing that? That's stupid. Um, can make more money and working for the platforms. I mean, I, I got into binary XML when like no one would be seen dead next to it. And I can confirm that it definitely wasn't glamorous, but it got me into like all these debates with all the XML luminaries for the people who remember what XML was. Um, I, I got to lead a status group when I was 25, just because I was on the right dumpster fire, um, doing the things that no one wanted to do. And it got me, it got me working on like constrained devices before the mobile web and mobile apps happened and all that. Um, and more recently, the same thing, going into privacy at a media company when everyone hates media companies for how bad at privacy they are, isn't, isn't the, the move that, yeah, let's, let's go where people are going to hate me. Um, isn't, <laughs> isn't the obvious thing, but it's been, illuminating, especially, I think, coming from tech, going to work at a place where it's so clear uh, how tech is affecting negatively the world and democracy and companies that weren't like platforms and major tech companies um, has been like hugely valuable. It's given me an entire new perspective on, on tech. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't understood just how aggressive 
tech companies are, are with the media. So yeah, in general, I think janitorial work and dumpster fires is, is really the way to go. It, it never gets boring. Well, as we wrap up, our final question is, this podcast is called How Tech Becomes Law. So given your experience, how have you seen technology and its design create new rules for how society operates? I mean, I think that's, yeah, that, that's such a wonderful question. I, I, I really love that, that you have that question on, on your show. It's like, I mean, as Lessig said, code is law, but the way we build technology t- t- today, code isn't law, it's, it's judge, jury, and executioner. Um, and I don't think tech should be built that way. But really, at the heart of it, technology is self-enforcing. So we, you can think about it as bureaucracy without the need for violence. Um, and, and that is very much, that is a hugely, hugely driving of behavior and, and of everything in society. And so, yeah, it, it, how we design technology has an immediate impact. I mean, um, a lot of the, the work on defining privacy today is about shaping what privacy means to society, shaping who has access to data and who doesn't and what you can do with it. Um, so inherently, I'm not even sure there's that much technology you can build that doesn't become law. It always does. Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for joining, Robin. And thank you for listening. I'm Dhruv Gupta with Jin Yen Zhang, and this was How Tech Becomes Law. Thanks for listening to How Tech Becomes Law. We are supported by the Public Interest Tech Lab. You can find us online at howtechbecomeslaw.org. And on social media channels at Tech Becomes Law. The music for this podcast was produced by Clarence Yap. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps other listeners discover us. Thanks again for listening and come back next week for another conversation on how tech becomes law. <laughs>